uh, officially. And uh, yep, it is being recorded. And uh, our our guest, well, I'm Jay Wimpy, the current president of uh, the American Civil Defense Association. So glad to have everyone here. And um, we are doing a, a little bit better with the Zoom this uh, uh, month. So anyway, hopefully everything will uh, go smooth from here. Uh, as our guest speaker tonight, we have Colonel Jim Smith. Um, he asked if he could just uh, uh, introduce himself. So we'll, uh, without any further um, delay, um, we'll go ahead and let him introduce himself and uh, let, uh, um, well, and let him uh, then proceed with the presentation. We'll answer questions as we go along through the chat or we can, um, or if you want to unmute yourself and ask a burning question uh, along the way, then uh, that would be okay too. We'll try to try to make be as responsive as possible. Uh, so okay. let's go ahead. Uh... Okay, thanks. Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, unfortunately, in some aspects, I've been doing this more than 50 years in terms of emergency medicine. I function as public safety director for a rural community and have lived in a major metropolitan area and served as a police commander and public safety commander there, went to USC, written several textbooks, got a lot more gray hair than this picture says now. And like I say, I've, I've been, been doing this a little bit. Here's some of the textbooks I've written, Homeland Security for emergency medical response, crisis management, law enforcement, bombs and bombings tactical medicine and we teach tac med essentials um is a free course i might add uh, how many times do you hear that this day and time for both physicians nurses and emsp personnel goodness i hate that. sorry about that i'm having trouble with my mouse wanting to be overly sensitive for whatever reason golly could try the right arrow key as well okay I will certainly do that. <laughs> Let's talk about bleeding control, burns, chest pain, febrile illness, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and dehydration. These will be uh, material you've heard before, maybe just a little refresher. Talk a little bit about animal bites, reptile bites, some of the hymenopterous stings, and some of the other problems you might see. And then we'll talk about taking the wrong medication or children, which unfortunately happens, uh, ingesting adult medication. And when you need to go to the hospital, uh, unfortunately, that's become a common, golly, I've got a brand new mouse and it is, and I apologize, super sensitive. And I'm trying to get to my right arrow, but not doing really well with that. What's the more dangerous? Statistically, which are more dangerous? Driving motor vehicle, living in a very high crime area, a uh, hospital inpatient or you're prescribed a new drug. What about a snake bite, honeybee sting, a bear attack, or handling cows as a cowboy? Uh, you know, and we think about that and we don't really realize that uh, these things are out there. And now that I found out deer do eat people, at least their carcasses, that's a definite a new one I'll have to put in there. But, you know, which of these is the more dangerous? And I was really astounded when I started doing some research for a presentation of this nature. You know, we could get about 45,000 people killed every year in motor vehicle crashes, and roughly 16,000 if you look at the US DOG data, DOJ data from homicides. But what impressed me was 100,000 by CDC, these are deaths by medical mistakes or reactions to medication. That's a very large number when we look at the rest of the stuff. Snakes don't kill many people. Honeybees, if you're allergic, yeah, you know, thousand a year die. It doesn't sound like much, but unless you're one of the thousand that die, uh, statistically less than one on bear attacks. Cows, if you're handling them as a cowboy, surprised about 300 people are killed every year. Shark attacks, less than one. And encounter with North American deer, not quote, eating you, but in a motor vehicle crash, roughly 200 people are killed. And there's some other studies, one that came out of Harvard, it's, it's really good, that suggests that we actually get a quarter million people killed by medical mistakes and uh, reactions to medication uh, that doesn't go well. That surprised me. R very rarely do we see this reported in the media. And unless you're in the uh, occupational area in some medical area, you don't hear much about it either. 
uh, and very rarely are these things investigated as homicides. Scene safety. This is something you're driving to and from work. You'll see a wreck. And your first thought is, hey, I need to get out and help somebody. I and mean, we know that a lot of people get injured and killed. Motor vehicle crashes, typically a very dangerous sight. Uh, somebody just sent me a video earlier today of a firefighter and a Connecticut state trooper getting hit by a vehicle at a motor vehicle crash scene. And they're actually downrange a couple hundred feet from where the initial crash started. And there's several emergency vehicles parked screening them, yet still they were struck. So that, that's very valid concern. Other vehicles may strike damaged vehicles, push them into you. You get unstable vehicles. So my rule of thumb is uh, if obviously if I'm working or in a uh, public safety vehicle, I'm going to stop. And in some instances when I'm off duty, if no one is there or no one appears competent, I will stop and usually have some at least of the uh, medical gear with me. If the person's entrapped, what are you going to have to have? You've got to have specialized equipment. You've got an unstable vehicle here, although it will be difficult to stabilize it. And you're going to need personnel that know what they're doing, that had the protective equipment. And the thing that always concerns me is that you'd be struck by another vehicle. This is particularly true if you've got an impaired driver. Um, that, that's one of the more frustrating things is we see some states removing um, the federal controls on controlled substances such as marijuana. We're seeing a lot of impaired drivers, even in the state I'm in where it's uh, no quantity is legal. Uh, we still have a lot, probably 30% of the impaired drivers we deal with are, are impaired from marijuana. So we have a lot of DUIs from controlled substances and also alcohol, the traditional one. Okay, some areas may not be too safe to go, period. Here you see uh, a scene in which SWAT personnel are dealing with people who are injured, both uh, civilian and law enforcement personnel. And uh, this day and time, uh, you just cannot assume that where you're going is going to be safe. Uh, even in a rural area, we have episodes with gunshots fired. Uh, some of the metropolitan areas around us have uh, 15, 20 instances each night in which shots are fired, and they have typically several people shot during the week. And we're not talking about a million people. We're talking about a population of less than a quarter million having this kind of problem. So it's, um, it, it's amazing to me. Uh, in my younger years as a patrol officer on the street, we rarely ever had a shots fired call. Now, um, they're answering them several per shift. And that's kind of scary because these bullets are going to go somewhere. And these idiots that are shooting into the air, bullets do come down. Ah, fouled that up, didn't I? I bumped my mouse. Sorry about that. Okay, let's talk about shock from blood loss. Very few people bleed to death this day and time. And part of that, I hate to say it, came from the 20 years war we were engaged in uh, with the sandbox in Afghanistan. Um, we learned that many of our personnel who we injured were literally bleeding to death externally. Uh, body armor, helmets, and uh, protective gear saved a lot of lives, but they bled to death from an arm or a leg wound. Uh, tourniquets work very well in most circumstances. Uh, how do you tell someone losing blood externally? You see it most of the time. Uh, what's a tourniquet going to do? Well, it's going to compress the artery you're bleeding from and slow or stop that bleeding. Uh, one of the things we teach people to look for in the tactical part we'll talk about in a minute is, is there a killer bleed in progress? Um, like I say, helmets and body armor do an excellent job in stopping fragments from IEDs. And uh, obviously a lot of them will stop bullets depending on what level, threat level body armor you're wearing. One of the things we tell people, see if you can feel a palpable radial artery to start with. If you can, then you probably got at least a 70 millimeter mercury blood pressure, maybe a little higher, uh, depending on whose textbook you're reading. BP likely 60 milligrams of mercury if you can feel it at the femoral artery. 
and less than 90 if you can feel it only at the carotid artery. We couple the rule of 100s. Uh, we say a BP less than 100 with a pulse over 100 suggests that there's shock from blood loss, the hypovolemic blood loss. We also use the same 100 rule for letting people go into uh, situations where they're wearing protective clothing, whether it be a firefighter, a bomb tech, or someone of that nature. If they got a pulse more than 100 and a core temp more than 100, they don't go in. They've got to be below both that. In a tactical setting where we're having things happen, particularly with gunfire, uh, we, we use the call a cab and go hot in tactical settings. That comes directly out of TAC Med Essentials. You call out if there's a threat, you have to abolish the threat before you can do anything. And typically if we take uh, gunfire or an IED detonates, then we wait about 30 seconds before we do anything. And no one's gonna bleed to death in 30 seconds, but it allows you to assess the scene, determine who's, if anyone is down, where they are and how you're gonna go, go about rescuing them. Then we proceed to take the person to hard cover. We compress any killer bleeds. And this is the opposite. Normally we wanna go with airway breathing circulation, but following a gunshot wound or an IED, that we wanna stop bleeding first. Then we want to assure that we've got an airway open and that our uh, victim is breathing and they're doing that adequately. When we get ready to move them, we do a brief neurological exam to make sure that we're not going to exacerbate any head and neck injuries. And we want to go to the nearest facility with the appropriate resources. Alabama did something strange back in the mid 90s. They established a trauma control center. And strangely enough, the only thing they changed in the way the state EMS system operated was the patient went to the hospital best suited for his or her needs. And that might be going an extra 50 miles. What they did is they reduced trauma deaths from motor vehicle crashes by 25%, simply changing where the person went to, whether it be by ground or, or uh, helicopter EMS. So that in and of itself is nowhere you need to go. Uh, if you're having a stroke, you need to know which hospital in your area handles stroke. Is it a rated stroke center? If you're having a stroke, you want to go to a rated stroke center for obvious things. Same thing's true with trauma and the same thing's true with cardiac issues. And the other thing that we tend to forget uh, with blood loss and burns, uh, control hypothermia. That is critical. Uh, burn victims, if you're ever going to burn unit, my gosh, they keep the things hot. 85 degrees is not uncommon, that's Fahrenheit, uh, to have one. And, uh, you know, you lose a lot of fluid and that carries away a lot of core heat with it. Same thing's true with blood. And of course, once again, I, I, this is difficult to emphasize because so many people don't think about it till it happens to them. Use your finger pads, not the tips, to check for pulse. We've some good studies pu published in Annals of Emergency Medicine show that uh, skilled nurses, physicians, and EMS personnel cannot feel a carotid pulse in a field type setting or an emergency department setting unless they concentrate in doing so in practice. And I would have thought, hey, that's a simple skill. I'm not ever not going to know how to do it. But these are difficult to locate. Um, in fact, if you look at American Heart, now that we don't even bother with uh, the people that are not trained medical personnel, we simply say, is the person breathing? If they're not breathing, then we presume they need chest compressions. They don't have a palpable pulse. So that's something you need to practice. If you don't do this every day, uh, and even if you do, it doesn't hurt periodically to practice. You'll find some people, uh, particularly petite women, essentially have no radial pulse very difficult to find and they might have a systolic blood pressure of 100 or less so something to think about need to know how to determine if they are in fact have cardiac activity bleeding you know you think about bleeding not going to happen to me uh sure it can happen to you first off you know keep gloves you'd think, well, that's, I'm not going to ever come in contact with anyone. If it's somebody in your family, uh, control of blood contact probably is not as critical, but if it's a stranger, 
how do you know whether they got hepatitis B or C or HIV? And per, HIV has pretty much become a chronic disease, whereas hepatitis B and C definitely can cause you harm. Hepatitis B will show up sometimes very quickly, sometimes later in your career, and hepatitis C may not show up for 25 years. Uh, but use whatever's necessary to control bleeding. Um, that can be a shirt, you know, anything, four by fours, battle dressing, gloved hand even. Um, and if you've got spurting bleeding, everyone knows that's from an artery. Consider a tourniquet, improvise to commercial. And one of the things we teach people, particularly EMS personnel, law enforcement, firefighters, that's how to put a tourniquet on by yourself in the dark. And you think, well, that's not ever going to be necessary. Obviously, these people have commercial tourniquets that are more easily assembled and used than one that we might improvise on the scene. Uh, gosh, if you're in the dark, you need to be able to do that. You need to be able to do it by feel, and you need to be able to do that one-handed because you never know when you may only have one hand. Uh, those of you that are in rural areas have a lot of farming, we encourage the farmers to carry a tourniquet with them. I cannot tell you the number of times that we have tractor overturns and we end up with somebody that almost bleeds to death before we can uh, get the bleeding stopped with a tourniquet or if they're entangled in farm machinery uh, and are cut. And, and they can simply apply it themselves. And in many instances, if you're in a rural area, it's a long wait for EMS and further, it may be a long wait till somebody finds you. Tourniquets are painful. They're going to hurt worse than the original wound. Uh, they hurt worse than the bullet wound. So you've got to leave them in place. People will ask you to take them off. Once they're applied, leave them in place. Wait till a physician or someone with some additional medical training says it has to come off. Think about this. Uh, one to two hours is what we tell people. There's, there's very little uh, damage that's going to be done. Uh, but we put tourniquets on people. We're doing orthopedic surgery. Granted, they're much uh, wider and use a little bit lower force than the ones that we crank on with the windlass, uh, but they're on four to six hours. So you can leave it on for quite a while. Uh, like I say, best thing to do is to get a commercial one. They're cheap. Uh, you can find them $15, $20, sometimes even less. The same thing's true of battle dressings. There's a pile of those out there. Um, the Israeli and the OLAS, O-A-L-E-S, are two that are very popular and commonly used. Uh, and there you go, putting the tourniquet on. The commercial one's easy to do. You wrap it around, tug the piece, crank down on the windlass till the um, bleeding stops, and note the time, and then go from there. That's uh, typically all you have to do. And once again, the poor person you're putting the tourniquet on or if you're putting it on yourself, it is going to hurt very much, more so typically than a bullet wound. The battle Can dressing, this the is- the application a, location of the tourniquet compared to the wound site? Yeah, typically two inches above, a couple inches. In reality, many instances, uh, we find where the entry point for the knife, for the bullet or the fragment and go a couple inches above it and crank down on that. Now, obviously you can't do that if you're at a joint. So you may have to go above a joint if it's close to a joint level. Uh, and here's another thing uh, I did not mention, it may take more than one tourniquet. We've had people with serious injuries to the leg that have taken two and three, particularly if it's a muscular male, uh, they've got their muscles are so hard to compress that it may take two or three. Uh, Battle dressings, same thing. You know, if you put one on, it bleeds through. You don't have a tourniquet readily available, put another one on. If you're using four by fours or strips of cloth, it bleeds through, add more. Don't take them off because you may pull out very vital clots that are forming. The Israeli battle dressing uh, simply goes over the wound. You slide the piece in, uh, wrap it tightly, and then it's got a bar at the end that clamps down. And these are... Uh, they're built for, and I'm not saying this in an ugly manner, but they're built for the lowest common denominator, which is what we have a lot of times in people who are uh, first time exposed in combat or first time they've seen a serious injury in the EMS setting. So we try to make this type of equipment uh, fairly simple. 
And like I say, the ones from TACMED Solutions, the OALES dressing, or the Israeli battle dressings and their knockoffs everywhere uh, work very well, give you good compression. Uh, many of these will give you multiple functions. You can dress basically any part of the body, uh, including the with the OLAS dressing from TACMED Essentials. I don't have any business interest in any of these. Um, you can, uh, it's got a cup that you can use for focal pressure or for eye injuries. So they're, they're well thought out. Someone who's been in combat or an EMS certainly put these things together. In the battle dressing, it can be used basically anywhere on the body. You can use them on the shoulder, on the neck, on the thigh. And like I said, these are inexpensive. They're packaged. Uh, you know, sterility is not something we're terribly concerned about in a field setting, but they are in a sterile condition, vacuum packed. And um, just don't put the, it around the neck. Well, you can. You actually can put it around the neck. Uh, you go under the armpit. And I didn't put a slide in there. I should have done that. You actually go under the armpit and the neck, and it, it will work quite well. But no, you don't go circumferentially around the neck. <laughs> That's a good point. Uh, but there's actually a way to control bleeding from the neck. Uh, and unfortunately, I've had to use that on more than one occasion. Okay. Some places... It's just hard to get people out. Uh, if they're down an embankment, if they're in an area where shots are being fired, they're in an area where you've got hostile individuals, uh, it may be difficult to get them out. One of the things that we do, and we recommend that anybody in public safety do, uh, if you've got to transport somebody, and if you've got a farm, you definitely want one of these, is to get these little inexpensive $15, $20 um, stretchers that are nylon, they're one-time use. Of course, people end up using them more. They'll support up to about 350, 400 pounds. It takes several people to carry a person out, but um, it gives you a rapid method to move them rather than doing the fireman's carry. And unfortunately, I've gotten too old for that to throw them over my shoulder and carry them out. Um, and usually most scenes uh, by the time you get a stretcher out, you've got some manpower available to do that. And the, most of the stuff is very inexpensive. It's not like the old days where this material is not easily available. And it was all very expensive. Even now, uh, I'm surprised as costs have come down, uh, particularly as we get a lot of surplus uh, material that's not going until the Ukraine started, it wasn't going overseas, and there was a lot of available at very inexpensive prices. That has changed. Talked to a manufacturer the day of battle dressings, and his commitment to the U.S. government was for the next four years of his production of battle dressings, and I'm presuming that's probably go to Ukraine. Fires. Man, we... You know, doesn't seem like a lot of people killed in fires, but in the 10, 11,000 people that are, depending on whose data you're reading, some say 9,000. Um, here's the problem. Burns consume a tremendous amount of medical resources. Um, I've read in some of the journals that over a ton of medical supplies will be used during the initial 30-day treatment period of a severely burned person. That's a tremendous amount of resources. What we're seeing, the deaths from fires typically are not thermal burns, but uh, thermal burns do occur. But the inhalation, uh, the cosmetic, goodness gracious, not cosmetics, the consumables that are present today in most homes' furniture have toxic materials that are produced when they burn. Uh, we see everything from cyanide, obviously carbon monoxide, and there's a dozen other toxic materials that are produced. So if you get a burn victim, one of the things we look at immediately is if they have soot on their face, around their nostrils, they're, they're hoarse, got a sore throat, anything to indicate that they were inside a structure with a fire or the heated, superheated gases, then we have to think about uh, lung injuries and the inhalation injuries and the toxic materials, we also routinely give uh, cyanide antidotes for people exposed in fires. Um, you know, that's the things we're worried about initially because that's what's going to kill them very quickly. 
clean, non-adherent dry dressings, what you want. Uh, we talked about inhalation injuries. Th those can be, they can kill you promptly. Uh, you can irrigate the burn with cool tap water or saline prior to uh, putting a dressing on. If you got debris present or if you want to cool the burn, remember even when the heat is removed from the burn itself, it's the tissue is still very hot. So you can, if you can gain access to cool tap water or saline, if you got that available, you can irrigate that to cool the um, tissue down. It's air that causes pain. Third degree burns are not painful in their own right because the nerve endings are destroyed as a general rule. So you wanna keep air out with a non-adherent dressing. Don't put anything on a burn, such as burn cream, butter, petroleum jelly, please do not put that on there. The burn surgeon is gonna be very angry, typically with the EMS personnel that brings this individual in thinking they may have applied it but it may convert, having to clean that stuff off, may convert a second degree partial thickness burn to a full thickness third degree burn. Get jewelry rings, watches, anything that's on an extremity that's been affected, uh, swelling will occur. In cold settings, this thing is kind of contradictory. Um, one has to worry about hypothermia because you've lost that waterproof covering and you're hemorrhaging fluid and it doesn't take a lot of fluid loss to cause you problems with hypothermia. Third degree burns are gonna give you the leathery brown, black or reddish colored skin. Second degree, as we all know from school, gives you blisters. First degree is just simply red and skin. Electrical burns many times to third degree and they're not visible as such. And one of the things that you need to know about is where's my nearest burn center? Uh, any third degree burns critical and that needs to be seen by somebody who is a burn surgeon and well trained to deal with that second degree burns at the face, neck, hand, feet or genitals is critical because you can get contractures, scarring and this, these definitely need prompt medical attention. The usual causes of burn deaths, believe it or not, the first 24 hours it's going to be that inhalation injury or if the person has core cope, I try that again, comorbidities a trauma outside the burn injury. In fact, uh, trauma with a burn injury, uh, we see sometimes a 50 to almost doubling in the mortality rate, let's say with a, a femur fracture or uh, some other substantial orthopedic injury. 24 to 48 hours, we're gonna see electrolyte fluid or metabolic issues and many multiple liters of IV fluids to replace fluid losses and of course, if the person is a diabetic or has uh, COPD, is elderly or very young, uh, they may not do well at all. 48, 72 hours beyond infection or the comorbidities will typically be the cause of death. Burns do get colonizing, oh my gosh, the bacteria, the things that some, some of the stuff that, that grows and burns is absolutely gross. And they, uh, I'm not going to go in that. Pseudomonas is one of the ones that really smells bad uh, that routinely colonizes burns. And here's the first degree uh, burn. You can see the thing that's really neat about this, you don't have any blisters. And if you can blanch the skin with touch, then you're probably going to get good healing. And yes, they have sensation and it hurts. Most physicians and burn teams will recommend that you use uh, an NSAID to try to reduce inflammation. Uh, ibuprofen is sometimes used. Um, most of your dressings are gonna use uh, silver. Silvadine's one of them. And these are nanoparticles of silver. And many, and this particular protocol came out of Australia, which is uh, for whatever reason, one of the leading uh, treatment centers for burns. Um, 48 hours, they want to take a look and remove the dressings and see whether or not this is going to be one they need to send to a formal burn center uh, or is one they may be a smaller injury might be able to be treated at a regional center rather than at a uh, one at a tertiary center. Complicated uh, burn wounds uh, are typically at high risk for scarring. This is particularly true for those who do not heal well, such as a diabetic or a person who might be older. 
Let's see if I can get this next slide. There we go. Uh, second degree burn, superficial dermal burn. Uh, you will typically get some capillary refill and you're going to have blisters. Uh, if you're treating a burn at home and not going to get medical treatment, leave the blisters intact. In the burn center or hospital setting, typically many burn surgeons like to do at about 48 hours removal, debreeding of the actual blisters and take a look and determine whether or not they're going to have to send this off for additional treatment or whether they can treat it on site. Uh, you do get some scarring sometimes and pigmentation changes is not unusual. And these things are very painful. Uh, remember, when you don't have skin covering, your nerve endings are exposed and that stimulates them and produces a tremendous amount of pain. And that's why you see burn patients getting large quantities of opioids uh, in an attempt to control the pain. And then you get the third degree full thickness Eh, pretty nasty looking stuff here. Um, healing times greater than 21 days. Normally with a second degree, if it's not extensive and the person heals well, we're looking at two weeks and they're getting close to having normal skin covering. Uh, now you may still end up with uh, some prolonged scarring, but hopefully that's not going to happen. Third degree burns, they may go a long time, uh, at least three, four weeks. Uh, you're typically gonna get some sort of scarring. Um, the big thing that you want to do is the moist healing of the wound uh, and, and keeping the things covered, except when you need to debreed them. Um, the stuff you debreed or burn with looks like a credit card and you literally are scraping away the dead tissue and trying to encourage new tissue to grow back without a tremendous amount of scarring. And that, that's oversimplified dramatically. Uh, extraordinarily painful process, I might add. Chest pain. I know every time I go to a Mexican restaurant, I end up with chest pain, but that's going to be because I'm not taking the stuff to stop the acid buildup or the spicy food. But if you have unexpected chest pain lasting more than two minutes, and this is per American heart, and it's unrelieved by movement, and is of a squeezing nature, radiating to a jaw and arm, and is in a person 30 or older, and that's what amazed me is we've now pushed that number, it used to be in 50, 60 range, uh, but now we've pushed it down to around 30 um, or older, or is in a person with a history or at risk for heart issues, you know, obese, uh, which fits many Americans today, high blood pressure, diabetes, previous cardiac problems, and they've got pericarditis, mitral valve prolapse, angina. Uh, and we talk about chest wall pain in a moment, but uh, you probably need to go ahead and call for help. Now, if you're in a rural area, uh, EMS takes 20, 30 minutes to get to, you may want to look at meeting them somewhere along the way at a predetermined point. Uh, that will reduce your travel time dramatically to the hospital because time is tissue. If you are in fact having the heart attack, the myocardial infarction, then yes, time is tissue. We wanna get you in the lab. We wanna go ahead shoot the dye in and see if you have any coronary arteries that are blocked or constricted or if it's a problem. Many times we find that's heartburn. Um, heartburn, uh, if it's relieved by something you can drink or some of the, um, golly, it went blank on that one. Some of the agents you take for heartburn, I'll leave it at that, uh, then yeah, you're, you're okay. If it's chest wall pain, like I have done from overexerting myself working in the yard, I know I can reproduce that pain and hey, that's chest wall pain. It's not cardiac related. Uh, if I can't rule out cardiac, then I'm gonna go to the hospital because there's a very good probability that we're gonna say, oh no, I've had this before, I'm not gonna go. And if you miss it, it can be life ending, but what's worse, it can cause you to have significant heart muscle damage and you're disabled and you can no longer enjoy life. So I'm gonna run the risk of a little bit of money spent at the hospital than I am 
missing an MI. Call for help. And once again, you know, don't drive yourself. What happens if you have a dysrhythmia and uh, <laughs> become unconscious on the way? Uh, yeah, it's called a car crash. And we see people every year that do this. Uh, they'll be having a diabetic episode of low blood sugar. What do they do? Jump in the car to drive to the hospital and their blood sugar causes them to become unconscious and they crash the car, injuring themselves and probably someone else. So get somebody to drive you or meet EMS somewhere along the way. Febrile illness. I think we learned this with COVID. Oh my goodness. Um, I think a lot of us stayed home when we probably should have talked to our physician and tolerate the fever. But now that we're turning to some semblance of normality, adults fever above 102, uh, you probably need to talk to your physician, nurse practitioner, PA, or whoever you're seeing about that, because that's, that's not a good thing. Uh, the thing I worry about, uh, do you have uh, COVID? Do you have influenza? Uh, do you have strep? Uh, and we think, why well, strep's only for children. No, no, it's not. We see quite a few and, and been seeing quite a few adults with strep and not really sure what the reason is. Now, the when COVID was really rampant and everyone was masked up, our influenza cases went down dramatically. And if you're some of the lucky people to get the over-the-counter test where you can actually look uh, and differentiate between COVID strep and um, influenza, then that's great. Most of the time, you're going to end up having to see someone in a professional setting to be able to do that. Uh, any of the uh, fever, a couple with nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, better go ahead and talk to your doctor. Uh, one of the things I worry about is getting dehydrated, and that can happen. Children with a fever, uh, if there's any doubt in your mind at all, uh, call your pediatrician. Children are so uh, developmentally different uh, from child to child, it's sometimes hard to have a hard and fast rule with them. Uh, when in doubt, call your pediatrician, let them make the decision as to whether or not they want to see the child. Many of them will go ahead and have the child in and, and take a look and see if they might be having strep. Strep, if not treated appropriately, can cause some long-term issues. And yes, adults do get strep. They do get haemophilus which is um, an inflammation and infection of the larynx, which can cause some very serious problems. So don't think you just got a simple case of laryngitis. Um, it could be strep, could be some of the more serious bacteria. Uh, granted, we see most of that in children, but no, it happens to people too, as we found out with COVID. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and dehydration. You know, last thing you want to do is keep up with how many times you've vomited, how many times you've had to go to the bathroom, and how much is involved. However, if you can pull the back skin up on the dorsum of the hand and it stays tinted more than a couple of seconds, you're probably dehydrated. Next time you work in the yard or get a bicycle or walk or whatever you do in a warm temperature, and you think you're dehydrated, try that. You'll be surprised how many times you are. Um, children, particularly very young children, very susceptible to dehydration. Um, sometimes one or two episodes of diarrhea uh, or vomiting in, in a very young child, those that are less than a year can cause them to be dehydrated. And normally that what goes along with that, if they're uh, a neonate, if they're less than 30 days old, and they probably have a low blood sugar in addition to the dehydration. And that, that's a pretty serious event for a child. If you're prescribed an anti-nausea agent by your physician, such as a Dancitron, you can, and hopefully something like that will control it. But once again, if you can pinch it up and it stays there more than a second or two, you're probably dehydrated. Many recommend Pedialyte for adults and children. Gatorade is not, uh, because of the sugar content, is not as recommended as it used to be. Um, and the uh, electrolyte balance in Pedia 
light is a little bit better for children than adults, although quite a few adults I know use it in lieu of other items. Um, keep fluids in the person. I mean, you know, if you can't control nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, you're going to get into trouble. You're going to have to see a physician, go to the emergency room, a rapid care facility, something, because you're going to have to have IV fluids. And you want to try to prevent that if at all possible. The thing that I see is the guys that get out in the woods a long way and they start this episodes. And by the time they can, if they, if they can even walk out, they're pretty severely hydrated after a four or five hour trek back to their vehicle. So that's something to think about if you're going out away from immediate care. Stings and bites. You know, I don't think anyone that goes out in the outdoors has not been stung by some sort of insect, uh, whether it be uh, a bee, wasp, hornet, whatever. However, there's a lot of people that, and you know, we're seeing quite a few people carrying EpiPens now, uh, and people with allergies to uh, food. We see people with corn and peanut allergies that are quite common. But bee stings uh, from any one of the Hymenoptera group uh, can be literally life ending. Uh, if the person is allergic, they need to be carrying, and I'm talking about people that are truly allergic that have at least two body systems involved. They've got edema, mouth, face, tongue, throat, uh, and they're wheezing and hoarse, and they've got involvement in the upper airway along with the lower airway. Uh, they definitely need an EpiPen. Now remember, the problem you get into is this buys you about 15 to 20 minutes of time in some circumstances may be uh, needed again. In fact, most of the packaging now contains two of the EpiPens, and I'm using that as a generic term, although there was another vendor. I'm not sure they're still out there. Um, call EMS, and if response time is long, meet them somewhere because you're going to probably need more epinephrine. Uh, and this truly is a life-threatening emergency. If the person starts wheezing, facial swelling, and they've got the hives, nausea, vomiting, any two of those are enough to use an EpiPen. Um, and here's the key. You'll be surprised how many people are actually allergic that you don't know about, that you work with. Uh, we're constantly discovering employees that have these uh, allergies, food allergies, or insect allergies, and they don't tell anyone. And their EpiPen is at home, where it does absolutely no good. Do you remember and, the question? Yeah, go ahead. About the EpiPen, if you don't have an EpiPen, can you use Benadryl? Will that do anything? Oh, yeah, absolutely. If you've got liquid Benadryl for children or Benadryl for adults and chew it up and swallow it, oh, absolutely. Uh, it hasn't been terribly long ago that I had an individual come to the um, public safety center with an allergic reaction uh, who did not have an EpiPen. We used epinephrine on board uh, one of the ambulances, but they had been smart enough to chew up um, Benadryl at home. And uh, of course, we followed it up with uh, IM Benadryl. But uh, yes, that's that's a good move. Um, so you know, why would you chew it versus swallow it? Chewing it uh, actually disperses it more quickly. Liquids even preferred over chewing. Uh, you have to, if you're an adult, you have to take more. But absolutely, if you can get it in to the person and they don't vomit it back up, then that's a very good thing. Um, yeah, you just don't have to wait for a pill to dissolve to be absorbed you, with the liquid version. You can get it into your system faster. You're looking at maybe 20 minutes to peak uh, absorption on oral meds, but if you get it started early in the ball game, you'll be much more ahead of things. Oh yes, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, that's why you'll see some medical personnel who will and they're not supposed to do this, chew up some tablets to get a blood level more quickly. Uh, you can do that. Um, but uh, some of them, I better be careful doing that. Uh, I would not recommend it with some, some agents. Uh, pull the blue also, cap off. Sorry, there's also a question on the chat. Um, Nick is wondering if you can get an EpiPen maybe over the counter or do you have to have a prescription? Still prescription. What uh, 
epinephrine is a very dangerous drug. Uh, and that's the reason they do make that um, prescription only as far as I know. I don't know of any state where it's not prescription. Let me put it that way. It may be, but if it is, I'm not aware of it. And here's the other thing, the ridiculous cost of the things. Um, this is one of the ones you may have read some media about that the price increased something like 500% over a couple year period when the other vendor went out of production of these and it became monopoly. So there's been a bunch of back and forth on that. And I don't know what the truth of the matter is, but uh, I, I do know they're expensive. And hey, don't throw them away. Um, if you've got one and it's still intact and you've not pulled the uh, blue tip off, some divers recently discovered a wreck uh, from World War II that had morphine and adrenaline in glass ampules. It's in the um, Caribbean where the temperature, you know, is quite warm in seawater. And they were both uh, retaining some of their uh, greater than 50% of their potency. So even if it tells you throw it away, I'd hang on to it because you might need it somewhere else. And you know, that way you might have one for the car, one for the house, one for recreational settings such as boat or whatever. So that's a thought anyway, from my perspective, that's what we try to drill into our patients that we deal with is buy several of them, even if they're expensive. All right, we talked about honeybees. Uh, they're only sting one time. It takes roughly a thousand stings to cause death from a non-allergic mechanism. And that number floats around depending upon whose literature you're looking at. Um, you may see people with 15 or 20,000 stings that survive and then some with a couple of hundred that go into uh, kidney failure. So it, it, uh, it really varies, but they, they can be dangerous for those that are allergic. The um, European honeybees don't swarm and attack like the um, Africanized bees do. <coughs> Excuse me for coughing. Ants, are you social insects? From this say, from that, from myth. I can't talk tonight. Anyway, the ones that we deal with that cause problems are fire ants. They came ashore in the early 1900s in Mobile, Alabama, and they spread to a good bit of the country. We see a few people that are allergic to them, uh, but not many. Uh, their, their sting is painful, but typically not lethal by any means, unless one gets in uh, to a nest of them and can't get out of it for some reason. Uh, the other yellow jackets, hornets, paper wasp, uh, and so forth. Yellow jackets, the most aggressive of the group and their venom tends to be more toxic and generates more allergic reactions than other members of Hymenoptera. Okay, Africanized bees, I mentioned this simply because life should be educated not to generate any fear or concern. Um, when these uh, are disturbed, the entire hive, usually about 60,000 bees is mobilized. And when the first one stings the individual, it leaves a pheromone that is an attack agent that guides the other bees in. You will notice that a substantial part of the US has activity from them. And this is 2013 data. Um, I couldn't find anything right off the bat uh, that is uh, more recent, but they'll chase you up to 1000 feet. And uh, the European honeybees, maybe a hundred of them will come after you if you disturb them and they might chase you a eh, hundred feet, not very far. Uh, 60,000 bees is, is a tremendous number of bees to attack you. And they will crawl in your nose, mouth, ears and make it very difficult to fight them off. Uh, how do you fight them off? Firefighting foam kills them almost immediately. Uh, you can use dry chemical or CO2 have both been used to get the bees off of people in terms of killing them. Uh, you'll spend a good bit of time if you're a responder, uh, picking them out of the person's airway, nose, uh, getting them out of the ears and eyes. Uh, they're, they're really aggressive and will, like I say, sting you and still be there. They don't, they don't let go. They're difficult to deal with. However, if you can get into a vehicle or house, residential structure, building something that's got air conditioning, 
They do not like cool weather, and this will hopefully calm them down a good degree. Uh, we have not seen any, the closest one we've had a fatality in this attack has been about 100 miles from here. And this was a guy using a bulldozer to demolish a house and a swarm attacked him. Uh, and, and UAB professor down in Florida uh, intervened in an attack, seen an attack there in um, Tucson. Uh, one in Albany, Georgia, just a bunch in Florida, some in Arizona, and one guy that survived 20,000 stings got hung in a tree and had a uh, hive that was swarming that attacked him. And that is unusual. Uh, typically, when Africanized bees swarm, they, they're not aggressive, which is not what you one would expect. Um, and if you are really interested in this, the United States Department of Agriculture and most state beekeepers, and uh, there's typically uh, one in every state, and I say that part of the Department of Agriculture that can give you considerable information on it. Um, I believe Florida State University's got a very good program if you're interested in that, uh, since they're having a lot of problems with them, that's available online. And uh, we, we train all our personnel, even though we've not had any Locally, we still train for it. We know it's a matter of time for what happens to us. Spiders, and I don't like spiders. They're sneaky, which is not true. They won't bother you unless you disturb them. Um, Lactrodectus mactans, which is the black widow, it is typically uh, fruitful throughout the U.S. in quite a few areas. Brown recluse, a little bit more limited range. And the brown widow, which is uh, Lactrodectus geometricus, uh, is one that's uh, not as widespread as black widow. Uh, brown recluse, you may not even know you've been uh, bitten by one. Um, a lot of people are bitten by the black widow or the uh, uh, brown widow and, and have absolutely no problems with them. In fact, recent uh, search for literature by one of the folks at uh, University of Alabama, uh, Birmingham Medical School looking for spider fatalities, could not find one in the medical literature that is from uh, black widow or brown widow spider bite. The hobo spider is also called a wandering spider. They do have somewhat of a toxic uh, venom and they're unusual. Uh, they're more of a tropical type spider than one that you'll find in cooler climates. The thing that we see from uh, the black widow is abdominal spasms are the more common thing. Um, usually uh, intravenous calcium chloride is given and reverses that along with some other muscle relaxers. Uh, they typically just don't see many in the emergency department. Uh, they just bite people and a lot of times they don't even know they're bitten. Uh, other spiders, you can go through that list that's uh, available online and uh, some of them are toxic and painful bite, but by far and large, they're not, they're not dangerous. Not like Australia where, <coughs> excuse me, everything from ants to spiders to snakes are, are very dangerous. Uh, this always looks nasty. Uh, this is the ulcer necrosis uh, from a brown recluse. If anybody doesn't like gross stuff, this is not a slide to look at. They got an enzyme which basically digests tissue um, and it digests, yeah, try to again, digest membranes rather than the hematoxic venom we see in uh, the pit vipers, which digest tissue and blood. Uh, they just, these things do not heal well. You get a secondary infection. I didn't hear that. Okay, I guess I want anything. But, um, these, okay. Anyway, these things are found in closets, closed, dark spaces. Many are the bites or when the spider is compressed while a person's putting on clothes or shoes. So if you have these, and a lot of areas do, uh, and you can look at uh, some of the maps and the ranges may not be accurate as those portrayed. 
I have some of the uh, pest control people tell me that we don't have them in this area and we have many of them here. Um, but you might want to shake your clothes out if you have problems with them. The same thing's true if you have scorpions in your area. Good idea for shoes and clothing, you know, shake it out because the last thing you want is a brown recluse to bite you. And supposedly these are bites. You can actually see the chelera marks from the black widow, uh, the dual punctures from those if you look very closely in some cases. Animal bites. The biggest thing that uh, we fear and rabies is endemic in our area is rabbit animals. Bats are, are the more common and then raccoons follow with there and then skunks. Rarely do we see uh, rabbit dogs or ferrets or, or other animals. Um, I, I tell you, if you see a skunk or a raccoon in the daytime or a bat in the daytime or a fox that approaches you, uh, good probability these things may be rabid. And we, we try to give them, uh, oh goodness gracious, get rid of that, uh, give them wide berth. Um, if you see a feral, a wild animal uh, in places where they shouldn't normally be or have a unusual canine approach you, or a skunk or raccoon, or furthermore, a bat, uh, they're probably rabbits, stay away from them. There's some good evidence to suggest that even bat feces can transmit rabies. And everyone wants to disagree with that, but we had a presumptive case in the 90s here of aerosol transmission of rabies and so with that in mind it is up to our ability when we're dealing with bats particularly a colony in a structure or in a cave to go ahead and go with the level c or b protection uh, we just don't want to run the risk uh, if you have exposure then you need to think about the rabies vaccine or the immune globulin uh, some people don't want to do that. Uh, the risk typically is not very high. And if it's your life uh, that's at risk, then I think I would do it. We had a nurse who acquired rabies here from presumptive contact with a bat. And uh, she had no recollection of it. And she died because she did not seek medical treatment. Otherwise, animal bites, bleeding control, wash the wound with soap and water. You know, we've gone away in times past, we used, oh my gosh, methylate, uh, pulvin and iodine and all sorts of uh, really potent germicidal uh, liquids to clean wounds. We discovered that doesn't do a lot of good. The good old soap and water like mother taught us years ago is the way to go. If you're bitten by a human, most assuredly, seek medical attention because we're worried about blood to blood transmission. Uh, we're concerned about hepatitis B and C, HIV, and just a multitude of bacterial infections. Uh, it's not uncommon to have someone get admitted to the hospital with a human bite. Venomous snakes, 100 species in North America, 45,000 snake bites annually in the US, 11,000 typically from venomous snakes. Less than a dozen of fatalities annually. This is CDC data. Snake bite, loca snake bite locations, usually the hands, feet, facial snake bites, and I'll let you guess, involve males and ethanol use as a rule. And we see some of those every year. Coral snakes, they're hard to, it's, it's very difficult to get bitten by a coral snake. You'll see in a minute why. Uh, pit vipers, they're hemotoxic venom, but they have a flat triangular shaped head. They have pits in the head, they're heat sensing. They've got extendable fangs in the rear of the mouth and it includes the rattlesnakes, cotton mouth, which is also called a water moccasin, copperhead. And here's the neat thing about uh, the pit vipers, same amount of venom is used to every pit viper. If you get hit by a snake and you begin to experience immediate pain and swelling, you have a venomous bite. Uh, about 30% uh, of snake bites are dry from pit vipers. In other words, very little, if any, venom is injected. You're not going to get immediate pain and swelling. Although I would suggest you go ahead with a follow-up on that and let somebody look at that, get your tetanus and 
they may even consider antibiotic treatment. Last time I looked um, a week or two ago, antivenom's $8,000 a vial, and it's not uncommon to use eight, 10 vials in uh, rattlesnake envenomation. And uh, untreated, good likelihood you'll lose the limb, possibly your life. Copper heads, copper colored, note that flat triangular head. They're not, usually not lethal, do need medical attention. Um, and they've got a very broad range. Typically you will see them around water, swamps, creeks, things of that nature. Coral snake, Eastern and Western look very similar. Thing to remember, red and yellow and black along the entire body, it has a blunt black snout like head. The adage red and yellow kill a fellow, red and black, men and black. Uh, coral snake colors are always red on yellow and then black. The king snake or milk snake, no venom, very similar, has a red snout and the coloration order is different. Uh, venom, the thing about the coral snakes, they're very, um, they're hard to find. I've seen two uh, in my career and they're very common around here, uh, but they're, they're secretive. They hide in the debris, rot trees, rarely in a residence. Um, if you're hit by one of these and actually get some venom, these, the effects may be delayed 12, 13 hours. Uh, and one of the things that you will quit doing is breathing. Uh, and that's not a good thing. Remember, red snouts, king snake, a blunt black snout is the coral snake. One of the things they will do if threatened or disturbed, uh, the coral snake will whip its head from side to side. They're small. There may be pencil thickness and a couple feet long at the most, usually less than a foot. Uh, that whipping that head from side to side is warning it's about to strike and bite. So that's one of the things that you definitely want to look out for if you see one of these. And of course, what do we always have? Alcohol was likely involved in this one. Notice the coloration, notice the black snout. And yes, that's a coral snake and it's nothing to play with. And yes, this individual was bitten. And as Bill Ingvall would say, here's your sign. Alabama father six paralyzed after being bitten by a coral snake. He thought it was a king snake. Wrong. Uh, he didn't know about the coloration. He did survive. But um, once again, don't play with snakes. Uh, notice that uh, the pit viper fangs or wide open mouth. These things can bite through normal footwear. So the the um, black snouted coral snake above that, hard for them to bite, fangs in the back of the mouth. And incidentally, they're in the same family that cobras are. So if you don't like snakes, um, a coral snake's one that you probably don't want to mess with. Uh, here's pit viper hematoxic venom. Uh, rapidly swelling, digestion of blood and tissue. And you can see these things happen pretty quickly. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, that's nasty wounds. They're hard to heal. Uh, may have to go in and do fasciotomies to prevent swelling, from cutting off blood supply. Really nasty stuff. But you're going to know immediately if you've been hit by a pit viper. Uh, you're going to have pain and swelling. And cotton mouth, uh, water moxin. Once again, notice the flat triangular heads. Um, these are around uh, swamps, creeks, streams. Uh, and here's the thing, cotton mouths are very aggressive. They will come, if you're fishing, um, they will come and get in the boat with you. Uh, and you hear the joke about people shooting holes in the bottom of the boat because of the snake. Well, that's true. It does happen. Uh, People will get so freaked out over the snake, they'll sink their boat. And once again, snake bite to the face by water moccasin. Yes, ethanol was involved. And as Bill Ingvall would say, here's your sign. Notice the swelling of the face. The snakes have a Jacob's organ, which they stick out as part of their sensing mechanisms and actually is, has a role in smelling. And uh, this individual was sticking his tongue out 
at the water moccasin and was bit in the face. He did survive. Um, people do some silly things. Rattlesnakes, piles of them, uh, all sorts of species. The more common ones that uh, you're going to encounter, Eastern Diamondback, the Western Diamondback, uh, they can deliver a large amount of venom and uh, through standard footwear without any trouble. Uh, they typically will give you a warning with rattle. The problem with it's coming from uh and that makes it uh, a rather iffy situation once again notice the flat triangular shaped heads um and this is a good reason when you're in the woods look where you step and look where you put your hands because unless you sit on them you're more likely to be bitten on the hands or the feet than anywhere else all right and we're about to wrap this up and i know we're running a little bit late um what happens when you take the wrong medication? And this happens to me periodically. I have, I take something and I go, oh my gosh, have I taken it today? Then I'll take it and realize, guess what? You have taken it. Go read the label directions and see what you need to do. Worst case scenario, call your doc. Uh, or you can call poison control. But for children, and I have seen several fatalities, they've gotten into grandma's purse and gotten out calcium channel blockers. These are very lethal, rapidly lethal to children. So if you have any medications, uh, keep them locked up from children. They're very, very curious and they may want to try the same candy, which they think some pills are, uh, as adults do. Another thing that we see, children get a hold of flint stones or some of the other chewable vitamins that uh, are sweet, and guess what? They'll chew up 30, 40 of them. Probably the most dangerous thing in those is iron, followed by vitamin D. Uh, vitamin D is um, stored in the liver and doesn't do you any good, but the iron definitely can cause some serious problems with, with children. So call poison control. Know who your poison control folks are. Know the number. And it's amazing what they can treat at home. Things I would never even think about doing uh, they'll have parents do at home, um, and it's astounding. They have a very, very good outcome. Uh, if there's any doubt, call EMS. And once again, calcium channel blockers are very dangerous for children. Um, and I think, nope, almost last slide. All right, when do you need to go to the hospital? We, we have a lot of people in the rural area here that take care of their own farm animals. Well, some of them tend to carry that over. And I'm laughing uh, because most of the time we have good outcomes when they do this. Uh, occasionally have bad outcomes. They'll treat their children and neighbors as if they're an animal. Uh, they'll splint broken bones. They'll give IV antibiotics. They'll suture up wounds uh, and, and typically do a good job. But occasionally we'll have a bad outcome. Uh, when that happens, uh, unfortunately, law enforcement may get involved. It's called practicing medicine without a license. And here's the other thing that I see. The medications that are used on animals don't have the strict quality controls in many instances that we do with human medications. So I, I don't want to take uh, an antibiotic designed for an animal uh, when I want a human antibiotic if I need that. And we've had folks have large reactions. Um, so anyway, once, once again, I want to, adults with a sustained fever, 102 Fahrenheit or higher, you need to talk to your doctor and any severe pain needs to be assessed by a physician. I have seen people try to tough it out with kidney stones. That's not going to work very well. You need to go see somebody about that. In primary care, uh, you may be one of the people that has a good bit of money and have a concierge physician that you can call 24-7, uh, and that's great if you do because he or she can tell you exactly what you need to do, can send you medicine. Otherwise, we go to primary care. If it's something where our primary care is closed or we need a little more urgency, then we'll go to an urgent care. And, um, and as you can see, as you progress to the emergency room where you may have, if it's like our emergency rooms here, a six to eight hour wait for something that's not really urgent, 
um, it, it gets more expensive as you go. So once again, and I just picked up, um, I don't recommend Columbus Regional Health. <laughs> I'm not even sure which Columbus this is. I think it's Columbus, Ohio. I just picked up one of the uh, uh, flyers that says, hey, when should you go see your physician? Anyway, I'm sorry I ran over uh, Shay and uh, Roseanne. I apologize, but anybody got any questions, I'll certainly try to answer them or at least try to refer them to another source. I stepped out for a minute, but uh, I just wanted to see, did you cover splinting? No, no, I did not. Um, and I should have, but I did not realize that until we got started. Those slides, unfortunately, didn't make it in. But let me tell you, the simple thing to do with splinting, got a broken arm, a magazine makes the best splint out there. And some of the folks where I come from use magazines and duct tape along with a uh, triangular bandage or a handkerchief to suspend that arm in a sling with the uh, magazine duct taped over it, including fractures of the upper arm or the, or the uh, clavicle. Uh, I've seen it work there. If it's a fracture typically of the leg, they're going to call for EMS. And that's when you get into trouble. If you have to move somebody rough terrain, you can always put uh, a blanket between their legs and tie the legs together with, and, and once again, I hate to say it, but duct tape gets commonly used for that purpose. Uh, and you can splint the leg to the other leg. And let me tell you something, a distal fib, tib fib fracture, distal third, around a little bit above the ankle, extraordinarily painful. Most people are not gonna let you move that very much. And if you've got rough terrain to go over, they're not gonna be happy unless you can get them some morphine or fentanyl. Um, you know, to control the pain while you move them. Great, thanks, Jim. Yes, sir. Jim, when you uh, mentioned uh, the bleeding, you said to do a uh, a cursory um, what neurological exam. What does that consist of? Typically, we ask the people, "Hey, do you know where you are?" What is today's date? Can you wiggle your fingers? Can you wiggle your toes? And, and we try to see if they can feel their fingers and toes. If they are, then we're gonna expediently move them, um, usually on a spine board or a rigid stretcher to uh, wherever we need to put them in an ambulance or a helicopter. We're not, gonna, we're not gonna do a full blown neurological exam at that point. Okay. Okay, yeah, quick clot. There's a lot of controversy, for lack of a better term, surrounding clotting agents. I will say that many of them work, many of them do not work. If you're going to use that sort of material, and to give you an idea, we do not carry it simply because of the controversy involved. Our uh, state medical directors and the, the people we deal with the tactical medicine uh, have, have just not committed to it at this point because there's so many outcomes that are not good and there's so many outcomes that are good. Um, some of the surgeons don't even like us packing off wounds, which is a routine thing we do in tactical situations. But I, I will say, proceed with caution. I believe that some of them do work quite well and some do not work very well. I will say, tell you, stay away from the zeolites these are the ones that actually are exothermic, generate heat, and they will burn you. They will stop the bleeding, but in the process, you'll end up with a burn to treat. Thank you. You can go online and find a lot of good material uh, with these agents. Uh, and, and like I say, some of them work, but I don't think the medical community, um, at least in the civilian side, has, has been willing to commit to using them routinely. Well, I guess that's about uh, time. We're definitely over a little bit, and, and we certainly do appreciate um, Colonel Smith's uh, uh, presentation here. Very, uh, uh, very pleased, very informative. And uh, other than that, we'll probably uh, let everybody go at this point, and, and uh, uh, you can uh, uh, 
either email us at info at and we'll try to uh, help you with any other burning questions. And like I said, the presentation should be available on the on the website by tomorrow, uh, as uh, as was covered in the chat. Anything else? Everybody have a good night. We'll uh, look forward to seeing you next month.